Okay, so it's my immense pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Vladimir Hamid Trojansky to this audience that seems really keen on, uh, you know, his, waiting for his presentation, which come from far afield. So welcome everyone to this uh, afternoon's uh, talk. Uh, Dr. Hamid Trojansky is a historian, a fellow historian, so welcome who works in the fields of global history, global migration, forced displacement, and refugee studies with particular focus on the Middle East studies, Russian studies, and Eastern European studies. Um, and the histories of Ottoman and Russian empires and their successor states. Uh, Dr. Hamid Trojansky's current book project, Empire of Refugees, North Caucasian Muslims and the late Ottoman state examines the resettlement of Muslim refugees from Russia in the Ottoman Empire prior to World War I. His book is based on archival research in over 20 public and private archives, including the archives in Turkey, Jordan, Bulgaria, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, the UK, Russia, and including the autonomous republics of Dagestan, Northern Ossetia, Al Alania, and Kabardino, Bulgaria. So that sounds just absolutely very impressive. <laughs> um, Dr. Hamid Turansky, as we were just discussing, his uh, article in the journal Past and Present has just come out this month. And it's on Ottoman and Egyptian quarantines and European debates on plague in the 1830s and 1840s. Today, he will be speaking to us on Muslim return migration from the Middle East to Russia from the 19th to the 21st century. So very intriguing and we're really looking forward to it. So the Zoom room is yours, Vladimir. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to thank um, Jan and Brett for organizing an uh, amazing Global Studies Colloquium and for inviting me. Uh, and thanks to Anshu for um, such a generous introduction and for sharing today. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. I know this is um, the Thanksgiving and Friendsgiving holiday, so I'm very grateful um, that, that you can, can be here. And happy Thanksgiving, everyone. On this day, as any day, I acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded ancestral lands of the Chumash people, and I pay my respects to Chumash elders, past and present, who hold the memories, traditions, and culture of this region. This talk was rescheduled um, from last week uh, when the UC lecture strike was supposed to take place, uh, and we have some good news. The University of California and UCAFT which represents non-Senate faculty and librarians of the University of California struck an agreement, which is tentatively celebrated as the best in UCAFT history. It provides more employment security and more pay for the labor of our lecturers who teach a third of all classes in the UC system. All right, to my talk. Um, I, I'm a historian of global migration and displacement. Um, I'm currently, finishing a book on the displacement and resettlement of about a million Muslim refugees from the Caucasus to the Ottoman Middle East in the late imperial period, which is uh, before World War I. And now I will share my screen. Can I put this knocked it out, Toshin, for some reason? Are you listening to anyone? Yeah. yeah. Today, I will talk about not emigration, but a related process, return migration from the Middle East to back to the Caucasus within Russia. And this research is based partially on um, my book manuscript and on an article that I'm writing. I will do the following. First, I will set the stage by explaining why so many Muslims from Russia had moved to the Middle East in the 19th century. I will go over different types of migration, uh, return migration in global history. I will then tell the story of Muslims return from the Middle East to the Caucasus in three parts. Return to the Russian Empire before World War I, return to the Soviet Union 
and returned to the Russian Federation since 1991. Return migration here is a, is a long process. And I look at multiple generations within the North Caucasian diaspora in the Middle East. And finally, I will go over uh, what this all means and what kind of conclusions we can draw. In the 19th century, Russia fought a war in the Caucasus. The Caucasus is a mountainous region between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. It had a majority Sunni Muslim population. This region was historically within the orbit of the Ottoman and Iranian empires, but never really controlled by them. It was divided into many um, autonomous um, Muslim states and statelands. In the final stage of the so-called Caucasus War, um, the Russian military uh, conducted an ethnic cleansing uh, on the Black Sea coast and expelled local Circassian Muslims from this strategic for Russia territory on the coast. Many activists in the Circassian diaspora today call for the recognition of, um, these, of this ethnic cleansing of these expulsions as the Circassian genocide. This term is denied categorically uh, by the Russian government. The expulsions um, by the military provoked um, mass emigration from the Caucasus. Uh, they provoked a mass refugee crisis. Up to a half million Circassians left for the Ottoman Empire within two years uh, in 1863 and 1864. It was one of the biggest displacements in Russian imperial history, um, second only to the emigration of Jewish communities from the Pale of Settlement uh, in the 19th century. And it was also the biggest refugee crisis in Ottoman history. Emigration continued through the next half century when the Caucasus was fully under Russian rule. And this is perhaps the surprising part. Several hundred thousand Muslims uh, were pushed out by economic reforms, by dispossession, uh, by Slavic settler colonialism, uh, or they emigrated because of the fear of Russification and conscription into the Tsarist army. And these Muslim emigrants came from different ethnic groups, uh, Circassians, Chechens, Ossetians, Abkhazians, um, Karashais and Balkars, Ingush, and several dozen ethnic groups on the Caspian Sea coast that are collectively known as Dagestanis. Uh, these communities speak languages that are unrelated, most of them are unrelated to Russian, Turkish, um, Armenian, Arabic, and they're also mutually um, unintelligible. The Ottomans settled North Caucasians in virtually every region of the empire in the Balkans, in Anatolia, and the Levant. This map is based on my data set of refugee villages, and by World War I, there were over 1,100 uh, brand new villages established by these North Caucasian refugees in um, modern day Turkey, Syria, um, Iraq, Jordan, and Israel. It was a very rural type of resettlement. Uh, North Caucasians were not allowed to move into cities. We should keep the bigger picture in mind for this period. The 20th century is known as the century of refugees, but in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Middle East, the timeline shifts earlier. As the Ottoman Empire was shrinking, more and more refugees fled to the Ottoman Empire from the territories lost to European empires and nation states. Uh, European imperialism and colonialism bred the displacement of indigenous Muslims. Meanwhile, in response to territorial attrition and humiliation by the European powers, radical and exclusive, exclusivist visions of a new type of Ottoman state emerged among many Ottoman elites. Christian subjects of the Sultan were increasingly persecuted. And during World War I, uh, the Ottoman state perpetrated um, a genocide against its Armenian, Assyrian, and Greek citizens. 
In this period, so roughly a century before World War I, about 5 million Muslim refugees, about half of them from Russia, uh, moved to the Ottoman Empire. And up to 3 million Christians left the Ottoman Empire. Many of them emigrated to the Americas, so it was uh, semi-voluntary emigration. Uh, many of them fled the Ottoman Empire as refugees and survivors of the genocide. Also up to 70,000 Jewish refugees from Eastern Europe moved to Ottoman Palestine in this period. Massive populations, population movements in the late 19th and early 20th century redrew the demographics and homogenized the Middle East into nation states, which were still multi-ethnic and quite diverse, but to a much lesser extent than they, um, than they were before. Now today, the North Caucasian diaspora in the Middle East numbers about two to three million people in Turkey, uh, where North Caucasians are the largest minority after the Kurds. About 100,000 in Syria and 100,000 in Jordan, 35,000 people in Iraq, and there are also smaller communities in Israel, Egypt, and Libya. At this point, very few North Caucasians in the Middle East speak their ancestral languages, uh, be it Circassian or Chechen or others. Most speak Arabic or Turkish as their native languages, but I don't want to discount that there still are uh, many young people, let's say in their 20s, who do speak fluent Circassian or Chechen, especially in, in Turkey, Israel, and Jordan. The preservation of heritage over the last 150 years is actually quite remarkable. And in terms of the North Caucasian civil society in the Middle East, uh, there's, there's a sort of revival as well. There are several dozen um, North Caucasian organizations, especially in, in Turkey, uh, with their own dance troops, um, libraries, languages, um, and they could only openly operate in Turkey uh, in the last couple of decades. So it is a revival. Now on to return migration. Return migration is an essential but often overlooked component of global migration. Practically every migration is followed by return. The issue is just how big the return ratio is. And when it comes to um, labor migration, for example, it is very common for anywhere between um, a third and half of migrants to return home. Um, we can distinguish between three different types of return migration in global history. Self-initiated return, repatriation, and refoulement. Self-initiated return presupposes a minimum involvement by the state and by non-governmental agencies. An example of self-initiated return would be um, return migration of Italian Americans from the United States back to Italy in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, we often, so if we think about Godfather, right, there's this idea that Italians came to the United States and, you know, and, and they stayed. The reality is that by World War, by, by 1920s, about 60% of all Southern Italians actually return to Italy. Now repatriation is spearheaded by a national or international agency following a breakdown in the country of residence or stabilization in the country of origin. A prominent case is the migration of ethnic Germans from the Soviet Union uh, to Germany and of Soviet Jews to Israel after 1991. And refoulement is forcible repatriation. It involves moving communities against their will uh, to their country of origin. It happened, uh, for example, after World War II, when the Allies forcibly repatriated um, Soviet, Soviet prisoners of war uh, from Nazi camps uh, back to the Soviet Union, uh, or the contemporary expulsion of Rohingya Muslims from Bangladesh to Myanmar. All these models are premised upon the country of origin being willing to accept incoming migrants. Now, the case of Muslim return migration uh, from the Middle East to Russia is different because the Russian government never allowed mass return of North Caucasians. So I'm looking at the case of self-initiated return that was unsanctioned from the perspective of the government. 
And the closest analogy here would be the return of Turkish refugees to Bulgaria, uh, Greece, and Serbia um, around World War I, and the return of Palestinians to the newly created state of Israel in the first years after 1948. Return migration from the Ottoman Empire to the Russian Empire started almost immediately in the 1860s, uh, and it lasted until the end of imperial rule. And from the very beginning, it was um, unsanctioned. The Ottomans refused to allow their new immigrants from leaving. They invested so much money into resettlement, and they just didn't want to lose this population and the labor force uh, back to Russia. It would also undermine the legitimacy um, if a Muslim population refused to live in the Muslim state and the last globally recognized caliphate and preferred to live under the rule of a Christian czar. The Russians didn't allow return migration. I argue that in the late imperial period, the Russians instituted a ban on the return, but they also developed an unwritten reimmigration policy. In 1861, uh, the Russian government banned the return of North Caucasians. The formal justification was that the resettlement of returnees would be expensive or that there was not enough land, not enough land in Russia uh, for resettlement. The actual reason was ideological. The government imagined returnees as Muslim fanatics who left the empire because of their affection for the Ottoman Caliph and who might be coming back as um, Ottoman spies or pan-Islamic propagandists. And it is the accusation against Muslims that we see uh, in other European empires at the time, in the French, British, and Dutch empires. For all intents and purposes, it was a Muslim ban, to use the infamous term from the, from the Trump era. It was a Russian version of the Muslim ban. The ban was specific to Muslim populations. And its, its reasoning was not bias against Muslim faith per se, but what the government thought the Muslim identity meant politically at the time that is Muslims loyalty to, um, to the Caliph, to the Ottoman Sultan. And this idea is not new in European history, uh, nor is it over. Today, especially since the so-called war on terror, the idea of Muslims disloyalty to the state, to the Western state, and correspondingly relegating um, Muslim citizens to second-class citizenship uh, have been explicit um, in the United States and in Europe. Remarkably, the Russian opposition to Muslim return migration was so strong that the government even made exception to its citizenship policy. The Russian empire did not have a denaturalization procedure. It actually had a very liberal uh, citizenship on, uh, policy on citizenship. Russia refused to acknowledge the right of Russian subjects to emigrate and to leave Russian subjecthood. It even had a long uh, dispute with the United States about, about this. Russia refused to accept that Russian subjects who emigrated to the United States were no longer Russian subjects. But not in the case of Muslims from the Caucasus. Once they left the empire, Russia effectively denaturalized them. Even more so, even when they were coming back to the Russian border with a Russian passport, there was an assumption that they have already become Ottoman subjects the moment they touched Ottoman soil. So it was effective denaturalization, although denaturalization was never legalized in the Russian empire. The most um, notorious re refugee returnee crisis took place uh, in 1865. Over 2,600 Chechens, came to the Russo-Ottoman border uh, and asked to return to Chechnya. They had left Russia semi-voluntarily and had only been in the Ottoman Empire for three months. So there was no way they could claim Ottoman citizenship. Legally, they were Russian subjects. They changed their mind and they wanted to return to Russia. Uh, the Russians were not letting them, the Cossack troops on the Russian side were not letting them go. Every night, Chechens tried to cross the border in secret and then they were pushed back by the Cossacks troops. It is somewhat reminiscent of what is happening today um, on the Poland-Belarus border, 
when many Iraqis who are being used um, by the Lukashenko regime are trying to enter the European Union to seek asylum. Meanwhile, the Polish soldiers are aggressively pushing them back, right? That is all happening amongst, amidst sub-zero temperatures. So the Chechen returnee refugee crisis was similar and it lasted several months through the winter. There was a protracted negotiation uh, during which Chechens offered to settle in Siberia, not in Chechnya. They just wanted to, to go back. The Russians refused. The Chechens then offered to accept Christianity, hoping that uh, the Tsarist government would rather allow new Christian subjects than the old Muslim subjects. But the Russian border guards um, and the Russian government, again, refused to accept them. The, this refugee crisis ended when the Ottoman troops arrived on the scene. They, the Ottoman troops put the cannons between the refugee camp and the border, and then they fired on refugees. And then refugees were escorted from the border by the Ottoman military as if they were prisoners uh, rather than the new immigrants. And then they were settled as immigrants uh, somewhere within the Ottoman Empire. This crisis changed things. In the coming years, so many Chechens secretly crossed the border that since 1871, Russian government instituted what I call an unwritten reimmigration policy. Muslim returnees were readmitted, but only if they were apprehended far inside the Russian territory. If they were apprehended in the frontier districts um, near the Ottoman border, they were deported on the spot. But if they made it far enough, uh, then their cases were reviewed for readmission. The reasoning was not humanitarian, it was fiscal. The cost of deportation um, was deemed too high because returnees needed to be escorted back. They wouldn't self-deport themselves. So the government needed to pay the, the, the army to escort them. So this is a fascinating case of the migration ban being based on ideological reasons, uh, the bias against the emigrants, religious identity, Fiscal concerns easily trumped ideology. Through my archival research in the Caucasus, I found that up to 40,000 um, Muslims managed to return to the Caucasus. Russia readmitted them, but did so quietly because the ban was always in place. Russian officials kept the policy secret from the Ottoman government so that it did not leak to um, uh, Muslim refugees in the Ottoman Empire. They, they feared the mass return. Let's move on and look at what happens in the 20th century. During World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapses. Uh, so, so, sorry, the Russian Empire collapses, the Ottomans collapse shortly afterwards. And the interwar era, Muslim migration between the Caucasus and the Middle East comes to a standstill in either direction. Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan are engaged in their nation building projects. Uh, meanwhile, the Soviets are building new nations in the Caucasus. After World War II, it gets even more difficult to get across the border. The border between Soviet Georgia and Armenia and independent Turkey becomes the Eastern part of the Iron Curtain. Turkey joins NATO three years after the establishment of the alliance in 1949. And then the border is sealed shut. No one goes in, no one goes out. At this point, there was no, um, correspondence, uh, there was no communication between North Caucasians in the Caucasus and North Caucasians in the Middle East for two to three generations. Things change in the 1960s. We are at the height of the Cold War. The global revolution is um, not going so well. And the Soviet Union is trying new strategies to um, win hearts and minds in the global South, including in the Middle East. This is when the Soviets remember that a century ago, Imperial Russia displaced up to a million Muslims to the Middle East. North Caucasian associations in Turkey, um, Syria, and Jordan had long been sending petitions to Soviet embassies asking to reestablish contacts with, with the homeland. Now the Soviets decided to give it a try. The Soviets' relationship with the diasporas uh, was difficult. Most people in the Soviet diaspora were either Jewish communities who had been displaced as refugees, fleeing pogroms in the 19th century, or 
uh, Ukrainians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, uh, Georgians, white Russians who fled uh, sometime between World War I and World War II. And by and large, these diasporas, um, they often held anti-Soviet sentiments and uh, many of them were part of the anti-Soviet uh, movement uh, in the West. So the Soviets were very anxious about the idea of diasporas. Since 1965, the Soviets started allowing delegations of North Caucasians to visit the Caucasus. As all trips to the Soviet Union by foreigners, these were carefully choreographed events. Delegations had official guides, they had curfews, they would visit factories and hospitals and schools and listen to fiery speeches about the Soviet revolutionary genius that was transforming the Caucasus and how you know, industry is winning and how the Soviet way is the way. Um, I argue that in reopening the Caucasus to the diaspora, the Soviet's goal was more or less to turn these visitors into agents of Soviet influence in the Middle East, um, but not in any way to allow return migration. The strategy worked in many cases. The delegates were already self-selecting. Many people were socialists. Uh, many North Caucasian activists were um, in leftist movements in their countries, but some visitors were less responsive to the Soviet message. In 1968, a Jordanian Circassian wrote a letter to the Soviet authorities shortly after visiting um, um, the Caucasus. I regret deeply that I traveled to the Caucasus, he writes. What will I tell people in Amman? I will, tell, I will first of all tell them that people there are kind, cheerful, hardworking, hospitable, and achieve the seemingly impossible, but they drink a lot, there are no mosques, and religion is relegated to the society's margins. I doubt that my children and I would ever want to come here again. Another Circassian from Jordan wrote that, yes, hospitals are very nice, but the Russians own everything in the Soviet Caucasus. They were sending these letters to the Soviet government. For many diasporans, there was disillusionment with Soviet society in the Caucasus. They perceived the rise of secularism and the dominance of Russian language and culture as evidence of cultural decline in the Caucasus under Soviet rule. The Soviets also misinterpreted or ignored what the diaspora wanted. While the diaspora welcomed the propaganda tours, what many people really wanted was to return. In the 1970s, the North Caucasian diaspora in the Middle East was split between two camps, uh, both quite socialist in orientation. The first were the so-called Remainists who argued that we need to stay in, in, in Turkey and in the Arab world. We just need to wait and, you know, and help. Their, we need to wait for a socialist revolution. And then all minorities will have their rights. We'll be able to speak our languages and everything's going to be all right. The second group were returnists. Uh, who believed that cultural assimilation had been so strong over the last hundred years that the only way to preserve their cultural identities was to return to the Caucasus. Otherwise, they would be Arabized and Turkified in the next generation. And the returnists came to dominate um, several diasporic organizations, and they wanted to negotiate return to the Caucasus. For the Soviets, North Caucasians were untested foreigners. They were either to capitalize and Western, because most of them would come from Turkey and Jordan, or they were too religious and conservative. They were still largely rural populations. The Soviets were not interested in new citizens. Instead, they wanted sympathetic ones in the Middle East. In other words, the Soviets wanted North Caucasians to be communists at home, but not communists in the Soviet Union. Interestingly, the Soviets um, allowed repatriation of Armenians from the Middle East. In the 1920s and 1940s, about 120,000 Armenians um, were allowed to repatriate to Soviet Armenia. And of course, those Armenians were survivors of the genocide. So they came from Anatolia and they had never been to the Caucasus before. Uh, these Armenian refugees played a huge role in revitalizing the Armenian nation and building up the um, Armenian state. Yerevan was a city built by refugees for refugees. But Armenia was a full Soviet Republic. North Caucasian republics were autonomous republics within Soviet Russia, right? F fully controlled uh, from Moscow. Uh, 
And allowing repatriation was out of the question because mass return would change demographic ratios in those republics and the balance of power. The Soviets never created a legislative framework for North Caucasian repatriation. The promise of mass repatriation came with the collapse of um, Soviet rule. In the age of perestroika and glasnost in the late 1980s, civil rights organizations in the Soviet North Caucasus called on the Soviet government to allow the repatriation of their co-ethnic diasporas in the Middle East. And these calls coincided with the archival revolution when Soviet historians were finally allow allowed to write about the expulsions in the 1860s and the existence of the diaspora in the Middle East, which was previously a taboo subject. For a short while, the repatriation of foreign North Caucasians was the rallying cry for nationalist movements in the region. In the 1990s, which was the freest era in Russian history, Circassian NGOs in the Caucasus and in the Middle East for the first time could establish an independent dialogue without, without the state. And they founded the International Circassian Association, which advocated various causes. The key demand of the International Circassian Association was repatriation and establishing the right of return on the Republican level and on the federal level. The parliaments of the Circassian Republics and the Circassian Republics are on the map in orange, the first three um, from the left side, Adigea, Karachayevo, Sharkesian, Kabardino, Balkaria, they passed legislation affirming the right of return. Uh, they also founded institutions to enact the resettlement of foreign repatriates. Return for the first time was seemed finally possible, but there was no support on the federal level. And in fact, there was significant opposition from the Kremlin. A lack of federal support dampened repatriation efforts. There was also a weakening interest from the diaspora. Thousands of people from visited the Caucasus in the 1990s. There was so much excitement about getting to see the region for the first time in 130 years. The Caucasus in the 1990s was a scene of economic collapse, like much of the post-Soviet world. Uh, there was high unemployment, high rates of um, alcohol abuse, skyrocketing crime, and the Caucasus, unlike much of Russia, um, also had um, ethnic conflicts and the two Chechen wars, which were the only separatist conflict within the Russian Federation. So many in the diaspora left. It was not, um, it was not safe for them to stay. By 2000, only slightly over 2000 Circassians returned to the Caucasus from the Middle East. I argue that the Russian federal government's reluctance to sanction mass repatriation stems from ideological and national security concerns. The Russian government invests heavily in the cultural narrative of the fraternity of uh, peoples, the Rusbu Narodov, uh, and a voluntary union of its many ethnic groups the narrative that it had inherited from the Soviets. It is Russia's origin story, if you will, uh, for its multi-ethnic federation. And repatriation of overseas North Caucasians is fundamentally a historical issue. It throws wide open the question of why North Caucasians ended up outside the Caucasus in the first place and what happened in the 1860s. In the 1990s, many public intellectuals in the Caucasus described the events of the early 1860s um, as ethnic cleansing at best and the Circassian genocide at worst. And therefore allowing repatriation could be interpreted as the Russian government's admission of czarist era atrocities, which it was not willing to do. And the stakes here are similar to Turkey's recognition of the Armenian genocide. The parliaments of two Circassian republics, um, Adige and kabardino balkaria actually recognized the Circassian genocide in the 1990s. So today that would seem unthinkable, but in the 1990s it was possible. But on the federal level, there was no recognition. Then there was the Sochi Olympics in uh, 2014. And during the Olympics, 
diasporic Circassian organizations made international headlines with calls to boycott the Olympics because the Olympics was taking place in Sochi, which is um, uh, the historical Circassian territory where the ethnic cleansing or genocide happened exactly 150 years ago. Uh, this campaign for genocide recognition did not go very well with the Kremlin, probably souring its attitudes towards the North Caucasian diaspora. And then there are the so-called national security concerns. The two Chechen wars in the 90s com further complicated the Russian government's relationship with the diaspora. Some Chechens from Jordan and elsewhere provided financial and logistical support to separatists in Chechnya, and some came to the Caucasus as um, foreign fighters. And we're talking about individuals, right? Not, not many people. Then a generation later, the flow of Islamist fighters was reversed. Um, all up to 2000, well, exactly 1700, Chechens and the Bistanis left Russia and went to Syria and Iraq to fight for the Islamic State and other jihadist um, organizations. And then some of the jihadist survivors and their families were returning to Russia. And that was very much sensationalized in the Russian media. That has nothing to do with the North Caucasian diaspora, of course, but the return of those jihadists from Iraq and Syria probably damaged how North Caucasian Muslim repatriation from the Middle East sounds to the Russian public. So it, it, it really did damage to the project of repatriation. The only federally sanctioned case of mass repatriation happened in 1998, uh, 1999, when the Circassians of Kosovo uh, were allowed to return to the Caucasus. Circassians were settled in Kosovo by the Ottomans in the 1860s, and they've lived there for over a century. And then they were trapped in a crossfire between the Serbian forces and the Kosovo Albanian forces during the Kosovo War. Under heavy lobbying by NGOs, Russia allowed um, the Kosovo Circassians to return. It was a very specific number, 174 people uh, immigrated in, in, in Russia, in the Caucasus. So this is the only sanctioned um, case of repatriation. There is the so-called compatriots legislation in Russia. In 2006, the Kremlin launched the state program for voluntary resettlement of compatriots abroad. Compatriots are eligible for expedited immigration and naturalization and state-funded resettlement benefits and um, exemptions. The legislation around compatriots does not specify the ethnic and national origin or historical reasons for being outside of Russia. Since 2006, um, over 800,000 people returned to Russia, immigrated and became Russian citizens under this legislation, but most of them are ethnic Russians who are immigrating from other, from post-Soviet countries, specifically from uh, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Armenia, and Moldova. And this program is seen as Russia, as part of Russia's new imperial idea of the Russian world, which seeks to unite all Russian speakers in the post-Soviet um, space. Technically, one would think that uh, Circassians and Chechens and other North Caucasians in the Middle East uh, would be eligible under this program, because after all, they are part of nations that historically lived on the territory of the Russian Federation. Uh, but North Caucasians never qualified under the scheme, to the best of my knowledge. In 2019, the Russian government, under pressure from several human rights organizations, um, acknowledged that people of North Caucasian origin, people of North Caucasian descent, can repatriate under this law. But then the pandemic hit, so you know, the repatriation uh, paused. And regardless, under this program, the North Caucasus republics were given very small quotas, about tens of people annually. So there still is little hope for mass repatriation, even under this scheme. And then there's the Syrian civil war. The Syrian civil war broke out in 2011 and it initiated a new wave of um, Circassian and Abkhazian return. By 2015, 
Circassian villages around Aleppo and Homs were caught amidst heavy fighting between the government troops, the Free Syrian Army, and the Kurdish forces. The town of Al-Raqqa, which was a North Caucasian refugee village in the Ottoman period, and then became the headquarters of the, of the so-called uh, Islamic State. Um, it was lost to Islamic State militants, and so many North Caucasians had to flee al Raqqa. And Russian-based and overseas North Caucasian organizations lobbied the government to allow the repatriation of um, Circassians from Syria. By now, about 5,000 people arrived in the North Caucasus on tourist and work visas. Uh, 2,000 of them remained in Russia and others moved on to Turkey or um, European countries. Those who remained are mostly undocumented. Uh, their visas expired and there's, um, there's really no legal mechanism uh, for most of them to apply for permanent residence and eventually to naturalization. So what kinds of conclusions can we make? The Russian imperial Muslim ban of 1861 proved to be remarkably durable. For all intents and purposes, it survived into Soviet and contemporary Russian eras, even if it is called something else. When is there a ban on return? Usually when returnees are not a favored group, and belong to an ethnic or religious minority. And when the ruling regime considers returnees undesirable for its state building project. In this case, the government always had ideological opposition to mass return, but, that re but the reasoning of the government evolved um, over the last 160 years. In every period here, different aspects of the diaspora's identity came under suspicion by the government. So the government was biased against different aspects of identity. In the imperial era, the new Muslim subjects of the Russian Tsar who emigrated to the Ottoman Empire were banned from returning primarily because they were Muslims and the government was insecure about its control of its new Muslim reg region on the Ottoman and Iranian border. The government painted Muslim returnees as um, uh, dangerous fanatics who could come back and spread um, Islamism or pro-Ottoman sentiments. In the Soviet era, the descendants of those North Caucasian refugees were not allowed to return because they were either too capitalist or too religious for the ostensibly atheist and um, uh, communist Caucasus. And then in modern Russia, the Kremlin has issue with the prospective returnees Middle Eastern Muslim identity with all underlying anti-Muslim biases after Russia's Chechen wars and then in the age of the so-called war on terror. And then the ethnic identity of the majority of North Caucasian diaspora, namely the Circassian identity became a heavily politicized issue and a, and, and a fundamentally historical issue. By acknowledging the Circassians right of return, Russia would need to grapple with its own imperial past, with the questions of imperialism, colonialism, genocide recognition, reparations. And that conversation barely started in the 1990s and it was all but extinguished in contemporary Russia. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. Anju, you're uh, muted. Sorry, I thought I had unmuted myself, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Vladimir, for that wonderful, um, you know, talk today that kind of covers such a vast and complicated region, uh, which is so complex in ethnic terms, uh, religious terms, and then uh, you also sort of, uh, temporally speaking, you cover a very, very long period of time through different sorts of empires and uh, regimes and so on and so forth. So this was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for, you know, enlightening us this afternoon. Um, I'm opening the space for questions. I'm sure there are lots and lots of them. And there are lots of people who are here in the audience today.
So my request is to, um, you know, put the icon, raise your hands and make your questions brief so that we can take in as many questions as possible. Uh, so if someone wants to start. Uh, you can also put your questions in the chat and I can, uh, you know, take it from there. Uh, Stefan Miescher has okay. his hand up. Yeah, Stefan, please go ahead. Okay, F thank you so much for this fascinating talk, Vladimir, and compliment. I mean, obviously you cover a lot of ground, a lot of time, a lot of spaces, and a compliment for the, for the beautiful maps. I guess my question is kind of a methodological question because what you told us here was a very, you know, complex, big story, but you kind of stayed on a more abstract level. And I'm wondering, you know, perhaps that's more what I <laughs> would be interested in, whether in your larger study there is space also to foreground individual stories of migration. So kind of to show how these different uh, migratory patterns which you have you know, so well analyzed in your talk actually played out in the life of individual men and women in this you know, time period from the middle of the 19th century to, to, the, to the end of the 20th century. Thank you so much, Stefan. Um, absolutely. So uh, I'll speak um, about the imperial period because that's when, uh, that's when there was most return migration. Many people who crossed the Russo-Ottoman border, they did so um, in an unsanctioned, und undocumented way from the perspective of the state. They were tried, um, they tried not to be caught. But we know the stories of, the, of those people who were apprehended by the Russian authorities. And when they were apprehended, they were taken to, uh, to the Caucasus authorities and they had to make an oral statement in their languages, which was then translated into Russian. So we actually have quite a few stories of those returnees. And uh, you know, from those stories, we can see uh, why they were moving back. And uh, what is what I find fascinating is just like emigration from the Caucasus, return migration to the Caucasus, it went across all ethnic groups in the Caucasus. It well, went all across um, different social classes and also the age groups. Entire families were coming back to there. And again, we're talking about walking like through the mountains, you know, in winter, through the snow, very dangerous journey. And sometimes it was men who hoped to go back, get the legal status, and then repatriate their families. Most people who came back they were completely impoverished in the Ottoman Empire. They um, either were not given good land by the Ottoman government, or um, they faced attacks by neighboring communities, especially if they were settled in um, nomadic territories and uh, nomadic groups claimed that the land was actually, uh, was actually theirs. So no one returned to the Caucasus in a better financial shape than um, when they left. Many people who returned, were actually enslaved. So for them, return to the Caucasus, return to the Russian Empire was a manumission of sorts. They were going back for quite literal uh, freedom. When they left the Caucasus, they were taken to the Middle East, to the Ottoman Empire, uh, by their notables um, to whom they were enslaved. Slavery remained legal in the Ottoman Empire throughout Ottoman rule. Um, but many slaves knew that the Russians were phasing out slavery in the Caucasus and slavery was phased out throughout the 1860s. It was part of the larger peasant reform in Russia. So we see a lot of petitions from people who are returning to the Caucasus and they're petitioning the government to resettle them there and also to give them freedom. So it's a lot of free and unfree return migration. Okay, any other hands up? Why don't I sort of, uh, you know, ask a question or really a comment? Um, so in the um, late 19th century, and in fact, from the mid 17th century, uh, you know, in India, um, Ottoman was a real attraction for the Indian Muslims as well. 
post-1857, when you know the big rebellion took place in India, post that, uh, the Ottoman Empire was a magnet really for the Indian Muslims as well. Uh, a colleague of mine, Seema Alvi, has actually written on you know this cosmopolitan Muslims uh, of the late 19th century and early 20th century as well. So. Uh, this kind of cosmopolitanism that we saw amongst the Muslims later as nationalism became, you know, an organizing principle for the, the new nations that were coming into existence becomes something that is, that works against the Muslims. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, so they're seen as not nationalist enough. Uh, so I'm wondering if there were similar sorts of ways of thinking that were there in the Russian Empire and, you know, uh, later in the, um, the Soviet Union and so on. And the other thing that uh, occurs to me as you were speaking is that for many, um, you spoke about one particular case where um, they were Remainists and not, you know, wanting to go back. But for many, the, the desire to go back to what is seen as the homeland is a very strong pull. And I was uh, wondering if you want to say something more about that. And we have a number of questions now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Anshu. Um, yes, so it did, it did this cosmopolitanism, if we, if we can call it that, it did work against um, many North Caucasians in the 20th century. So 1923, independent Turkey, there are new laws against speaking languages that are not Turkish. Everyone becomes a Turk in Turkey, right? There's this euphemism, the, um, the Kurds became mountain Turks and the North Caucasians became the Caucasus Turks, which of course they were not. But uh, this North Caucasian communities were not allowed to speak their languages in public. And all the society that came up in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, um, all the associations were closed, all the sports clubs, newspapers were closed. So it all went to the ground. And for a whole generation until the 1950s, we really don't see references to Circassians and Chechens as if they don't exist in Turkey. And then it becomes a little bit easier in the 1960s, but then there were consecutive coups in Turkey. And after the coup of 1980, especially, again, it became very dangerous for people to talk about their identity because it connected to the Caucasus, which was part of the Soviet Union, right? Mm -hmm. So there was the accusation of them potentially being socialists. Likewise, on the other side, in the right. Caucasus, it was unwise for many North Caucasians to talk about having relatives outside, especially in capitalist Turkey. So people didn't talk about this history. They tried to forget, at least as far as the authorities were concerned, um, about their relatives. And back to the question of methodology, mm -hmm. that's why it's also quite difficult to find private papers, mm -hmm. right? private letters that the families had exchanged. There was very little communication. And even if there was, people were burning those letters. Right. I tried to do outreach among North Caucasian diaspora in the Middle East. And people were usually telling me like, no, after the coup of 1980 in Turkey, we burnt everything that we had because we did not want anyone to know that A, we're not Turks and B, we have links to the Soviet Union. Um, yes, and uh, I mean, the desire to go back because it is the homeland, I think it is the, it was the strongest reason for return migration like throughout this entire period, especially when we think about the um, 1990s, the latest era. I mean, at this point, people haven't been to the Caucasus for 130 years, right? New generations grew up who know nothing about the Caucasus. Exactly. And yes, there's this incredibly strong pull. We have uh, ant anthropologists such as, uh, um, RGS and uh, Setane Shami, they did incredible work uh, documenting stories of people who say, yes, we, we grew up in Turkey, we grew up in Jordan and Syria, but we never really felt like we belong there. And so we felt like we belong in the Caucasus. And of course, and this is the story of return migration and global history, they go back to the Caucasus and they're happy to be there, but the society is so different and many people treat them as their Turks and Jordanians and, you know, and Syrians, but not actually Circassians and Abkhazians. Mm 
So in recent decades, we also see return, return migration, right? People who returned actually going back home <laughs> and are kind of being split. Yeah, and the feeling of not belonging really anywhere. That's terrible. We have a whole lot of questions. So let's start with uh, Hasegawa, followed by Jan and followed by Vishnu. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that's a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. I have uh, many questions, but I, myself, uh, I decided to limit myself to two questions. One uh, that deals with the Soviet um, policy towards uh, those North Caucasus. One, how come that they did not, I mean, how come that they created autonomous republic rather than, rather than republic? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. if it is a mult, because it is multiplicity with ethnicity, then Georgia has, for instance, Abkhazia, for instance, right? And so the within, within uh, itself, there are many multi, and then why is it, is it, is it not elevated to republic and not just, yes. Just, just merely autonomous republic within uh, within the Russian Federation. I mean, the Russian. Uh, mm -hmm. RSSS. That's the first question. Second question is that is that what was really happening during World War Two, for instance, in Crimea, for instance. This there's a terrible ethnic cleansing, and the Crimean Tatars were mm -hmm. uh, the totally uh, ethnic cleansing and expelled from the, from the region. But the similar things happening there in the North, uh, North Caucasus, because if they were not sure about their you know, uh, loyalty, and you know, that's um, fairly close to you know, the Iran, you know, and that's German, mm -hmm. and that might be uh, National security crisis, and then you know that the Koreans were removed mm -hmm. from Far East, and the uh, uh, Korean Tatars were removed from from Crimea, and so forth. Uh, I was wondering if the similar things were happening there in the North Caucasus. Thank you, Toshi. Are we stacking questions? Uh, I think you could, for the moment, answer okay. as, as they come, <laughs> and then we'll see. Okay, two huge questions. Thank you so much, Toshi. Um, so how come the Soviets <laughs> created autonomous republics, not full republics in the North Caucasus? My understanding is that in the 1920s, like there was a chance for them to be something bigger than autonomous republics. And the Soviets were really banking on their um, like anti-Tsarist image and reversing the damage of the imperial period. Uh, so for example, they one of the first victims of Soviet deportations were the Cossacks, so Russian-speaking, Ukrainian-speaking Cossacks from the North Caucasus, right, who were widely seen as colonizers and their oppressors by indigenous uh, Muslim people of the North Caucasus. But then all the gains, then there was the nationalities policy in the late 1920s, so the kind of extravaganza of sponsoring um, ethnic diversity in the Soviet Union. But then in the 1930s, it was reversed across the Union. And not only North Caucasians did not end up with full republics, there was also explicit divide and rule policy. Mm -hmm. So for example, the three Circassian republics that I showed on the map, two of them, um, in two of them, the Circassian nation, the, the Circassians, are sharing those republics with the Turkic speaking group to make sure that no one really predominates there. And this is, um, this is a cause of grievance, right? Since 1991, um, there were some ethnic tensions on that ground. And in the third one, the Republic of Adygea, the Circassians, which is a Circassian Republic, Circassians are a minority and the Russian speakers and ethnic Russians uh, are a majority there. So it was a, the Soviets were very explicit uh, what they were doing uh, in the North Caucasus. And that dates back to the 1930s and then also immediately uh, after World War II, which brings me to your second question. I will also say that Abkhazia is a unique case because Abkhazia joined the Soviet Union as a full republic, but then it was subsumed by the Georgian Republic uh, 
right? Then it was part of the uh, Transcaucasian Republic and eventually it never restored its uh, full status as a Republic. Hence the grievances and then the Abkhaz Georgian War um, in the early 1990s. Uh, so, Again, it's also, it's not just about what, the, what Moscow was doing, what the local elites were doing, right? In this case, the, the Georgian nationalists is hugely important. So during um, World War II, Crimean Tatars and overall about 10 ethnic groups were um, deported in their entirety uh, from their regions. Um, in the North Caucasus, all Turkic groups um, Turkic speaking people were deported, Chechens and English were deported in their entirety. Uh, Kabardian elites, would, ma many were deported, but largely Circassians um, and Ossetians uh, got, to, got to stay. Interestingly, some Circassians who fought, um, some Circassians after World War II managed to remain in, in Europe. Right, they refused to be repatriated back to the Soviet Union, and many of them then joined uh, the existing North Caucasian diaspora in the Middle East, especially in Jordan, while others uh, moved to the United States, and uh, many of them became the bulk of the um, of the U.S. North Caucasian diaspora. The center of the North Caucasian diaspora in the United States is um, Patterson in New Jersey. So, so there are multiple waves of uh, kind of increasing the diaspora in the Middle East to different displacements. Jan? Uh, yes, um, Vladimir, thanks. That was very interesting. Um, a small question or pressure of Russia on Muslims, does it have something to do with the Russian war against Persia at a time that was part of the great game, their competition with, with, with uh, Britain. Then two other questions which have to do with the trees and the forest. I enjoyed the detail and the nuance, different time periods, different actors and so forth. Yet, I also want to understand patterns. Question one. What is the relationship between these dynamics and the nationalities policy that James Altman is working on? And a related question is, or a wider question is, Vladimir, why is this important? I find it important, your narrative and your detail, but I would like to hear from your point of view, why do you, why do you find this important? Okay, thank you, thank you, Jan. So, uh, in terms of the the R Russia's wars with Iran, there were two important wars in the first half of the nineteenth century. As a result of those two wars, uh, Russia uh, got the South Caucasus, so modern day uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. So Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Right, uh, the South Caucasus became part of the Russian Empire which was the pretext for the latest phase of the Caucasus War when Russia decided to conquer the North Caucasus as well to have easier access to the South Caucasus. Uh, as a result with war with Iran, uh, there was some migration, not much of it. Mostly it was Armenian migration from Iran to the Caucasus. Migration of Muslims was uh, mostly out of Russia to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, most refugees who emigrated were Sunni Muslims, uh, they were way more, it was easier for them to migrate to the Ottoman Empire, not to Iran. Uh, now the, so the nationalities policy in the Soviet Union is um, in the 1920s. And that's when we, that's when the Soviet Union sponsors uh, national literatures, national, um, national writing, like take a while to develop the uh, different scripts for the North Caucasian languages. At first, they uh, move everything from Arabic into the, um, in, to the Latin script. There was actually a plan to turn Arabic, to lay Arabic on the um, Latin script, like for those who spoke Arabic uh, in the Soviet Union. There was also a plan to turn Russian on the Latin script, which is wild. Uh, 
And then in the 1930s, they uh, move all the languages that they just moved to Latin script to the, to the Cyrillic script. Uh, and there's, there are a lot of connections between this process and what was happening in the Ottoman Empire in the, in the 1900s and 1910s, because many language reforms and educational reforms were actually directed by the North Caucasian elites, uh, the notables, in Istanbul. Right. And then everything was shut down in Turkey in 1920 for them, but their idea kind of moved to the Caucasus. So it is the case when the cultural advancement in the diaspora affected right, the cultural, the nation making in the, um, in the origin country, in the country of origin. Okay, um, I think this case, allows us to theorize quite a bit about um, unsanctioned, uh, undocumented return migration, because much of the literature on the, on the topic of repatriation, it's about either voluntary or forcible repatriation when the state wants the returnees. Here we see the case when the state repeatedly does not want returnees, right, over 160 years. So uh, th that makes um, quite a unique case. And then why I personally find this important is it's about Russo-Ottoman migrations as a whole. There, I call it the sectarian order that emerged in the 19th century and the early 20th century. And the idea of the sectarian order uh, which was in Eastern Europe and the Middle East, was that Muslims were increasingly fleeing to the Ottoman Empire and Christians from the Ottoman Empire were increasingly going to Russia or Greece or the Balkans. So there was this religious kind of sorting. The current state of literature um, really emphasizes the interwar era, right? The, the age of nationalism, the League of Nations, the, you know, the, the, the post-Versailles order. And uh, the emphasis is on the ethnic sorting. Um, the Armenian genocide, the, uh, the population exchange between Greece and Turkey. So I'm arguing that this all started much earlier, at least in the northern borderlands of the Middle East. Return migration, in this case, it makes the picture that much more complicated because this is something that we, we very rarely see, that Muslims are actually refusing to live under the rule of, of a Muslim Sultan and the Caliph and they're returning uh, to, the, to the Christian state. So yeah, this kind of, this history is complicated, but like this, 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 this really complicates um, the, the, the traditional patterns that we see. Um, and it also warns us against essentializing people's experiences and perhaps the essentializing religious identity as such. Thanks, Vladimir. Okay. Vishnu. Thank you, Vladimir, for this amazing talk and particularly for bringing us right up to our current moment um, and giving us the historical view. I'm sort of following on some of the discussion that has gone on, uh, including, uh, you know, Jan's uh, uh, a question about why, how does this work make us think about repatriation claims at the current juncture? So I was actually thinking about how what you traced for us in this very complicated story is a kind of a repatriation uh, social imaginary you know, in which one of the coordinates seems to be around heritage. So it seems like in the, the durable Muslim ban is about people who will never be absorbed, right? So they will never share cultural heritage. So all this work around heritage as shared loss on the one hand, and the other end is historical injury, that something has been done to us and we demand justice. And I'm actually thinking about it with a very different uh, eye, which Anshu will know better than me, is the Indian partition, which was a completely different event, right? But you could think about it as a violent event, but over the last 60, 70 years in the Bengal border has been really porous, right? So lots of Bangladeshis coming back in, there was never repatriation, 
And there are two kinds of stories that come out. One is about, oh, I had to leave if this horrible thing that the state did to us. And so I need to get back my business, my home, et cetera. And this is the historical injury narrative, which goes back to your 1865, mm -hmm. you know, horrible disaster, right? Uh, so there's that narrative. And the other is about, you know, I lost my language and my culture and my history and my heroes and my self and my what I can pass on to my children. And that's the heritage argument. So it's somewhere the re a repatriation imaginary seems to hang between loss and injury. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, goes back to Stefan's original question also, that how these things seem to work in this current moment where the Soviets can't actually admit to what they did and they can't see these people as ever assimilating, you know? So I don't know if it's a question or it's of interest, but yeah, if you could uh, say a little bit about that. Thank you so much, Bishnu. There's so much to think about here. Um, the diasporic narrative, the North Caucasian diasporic narrative changed quite a bit over this uh, period. So in the late imperial period, one would think, right, that uh, there was an emphasis on the expulsions, right, and the horrible things that happened in the 1860s. And I mean, the expulsions were brutal. Villages were burnt, people were murdered. Um, the mortality rate was up to 50%. So the, the beaches of um, Anatolia on the Black Sea, uh, people were being buried on the beach, right? There was the outbreak of typhus and everything. It, it was horrifying. However, in the 1900s and 1910s, the first newspapers, the first Circassian language newspapers in the Ottoman Empire, they don't talk about it. There's barely any emphasis on the 1860s. There's no discussion of trauma and there's very little condemnation of Russia. The condemnation is of the Ottoman government. They didn't do enough to resettle. They didn't provide enough uh, you know, funding, enough support. So my guess that it has something to do with the, with the cultural taboos within the diaspora about discussing that kind of drama, about making it open, about making them seem like victims. Uh, but then things begin to change since the, especially since the 1980s and since the opening of the archives, there, there are many historians and the earlier historians were from the diaspora who mined the archives, who found out right about, about the ethnic cleansing, about the horror of this all. And now the emphasis is very much on the ethnic cleansing and on the uh, recognition of the, of the genocide. So it's, 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 it's much more raw within the diaspora. It's, very, it's a very sensitive issue. Um, and about the way forward, I do not foresee that there will be uh, mass repatriation. It is also very difficult to um, to a certain how many people in the diaspora would want to return to the Caucasus at present. I don't think we're talking about, it's not 100% of the diaspora whatsoever, right? I, I don't know what the percentage is. Uh, I think the conversation needs to, it is about the current political system in Russia, and it is about the strength of civil society in Russia. The conversation needs to start there, like people need to start talking about what happened. And again, as I as I finished my talk, it's about the bigger questions of, of the Russian empire and how much the current Russian society um, is attached to that notion, right? And then we can, and then it will be easier to, to move the conversation forward and perhaps to allow more repatriation. Thank you. Uh, Sarp. Hi everyone, thanks to Vladimir for your speech. It was very educative. Uh, I uh, I kind of agree with your argument that that like before the interwar nationalism and like ethno sorting, there was this religious sorting prior to World War One, which I think makes perfect sense. And uh, I mean, it's also validated by like that this obsession of many Ottoman statesmen to make no part of the empire Christian majority, right? That they are pretty much freaked about the, like uh, interventions from the great powers that you know they will divide up the empire based on like this type of like demographic understandings so 
uh, at least since the late 19th century, beginning with the Hamidian era, there is this ongoing obsession that like every single part of the empire must be Muslim majority. And this later is actually inherited by the Republican Turkish leadership, although not in religious terms, but in this time nationalist term. No, no part of the new republic must be more than like 50% uh, non-Turkish speakers. So, uh, so my question is that uh, I was looking at your map the, at the beginning phase of your speech, and I saw that most of the relocations were made actually uh, and not relocations most of the locations of this uh, migrant communities were central anatolia which were more or less more muslim majority okay. but the real question for the ottoman statesman was eastern anatolia that you know that was the conflict zone between the armenians and the i mean the consequent genocides obviously so do you have any notion any idea why didn't they choose eastern anatolia but central anatolia to relocate these uh caucasus refugees thank you so much sarp i do let me share the map again so here it is Okay, so I would actually argue that, yes, the religious sorting started earlier. I think it started as early as uh, the Treaty of Kushuk Kainarja, right, in the late um, 18th century, the great loss, one of the first great losses, territorial attrition for the Ottoman Empire. Um, but it was largely people-driven, right? Like, at that point, the states, the two, the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire was were not yet that concerned about the demographic makeup of their borderlands. So that's what's fascinating. For the first, for that century, it's people who are kind of getting a sense that they might be safer on the other side, that they might get more subsidies, that they might get better land, be, be treated better. And that's why, that's your second question, that's what that's why this map looks the way it looks. In the 1860s, when refugee migration uh, begins from the Caucasus. The Ottomans are not concerned about the, the demographic makeup and changing the demographic ratios that much. It's their first major refugee crisis. They don't have enough money and they don't have the know-how of settling so many people. Um, just a few years prior to that, they, 1857, um, they the Ottoman immigration law. And that Ottoman immigration law was very similar to immigration laws in other European empires and also in the United States and in settler colonial societies. They were hoping that European peasants, white European peasants would come and colonize the Ottoman empire. Like that was their idea of immigrants. And then in the 1860s, they get all those refugees who need so much more help than a regular immigrant would need. So they're just trying to settle them wherever else land and wherever they could, could get them as expediently as possible from the coast, from those ships. And that's it's the colonization of um, primarily central Anatolia and also western Anatolia. It's really where you can get people from the coast. And this, the, the situation looks, looks, looks similar in the Balkans, that it's the areas that are adjacent to, to the coast. Now, 1878, right, that's the the most important, the major Russo-Ottoman war, it's the loss of half of the Balkans for the Ottoman Empire. It's the loss of, I think, up to half of the Christian subjects uh, in, in, in the Ottoman Empire. That's when the Ottomans start counting people. They do that because the Europeans count people at this point. And it's part of the negotiations. It's part of the Berlin Treaty. Everyone counts the faith of people living in the borderlands. And after 1878, the Ottomans start directing the refugee flows from the Caucasus, from Crete, from the Balkans to the frontiers of the empire to prop up the Muslim population there to make sure that those territories stay within the Ottoman Empire, right? And this is kind of beginning the path to, is demographic engineering explicitly, and it's also a path to ethnic cleansing and eventually a genocide. Uh, so yeah, and then is, is the story that you mentioned, right? The, the exclusivist policies of the Committee of Union and Progress, uh, the Ottoman leadership um, in the 1910s, where um, Muslims have to prop up the frontiers. Thanks, sir. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Uh, 
I received another question in the chat, so I'll read it out. Uh, it's from uh, James Cheng. Did the United States have a Muslim policy at the time, or was it a country immigration issue? Uh, so the immigration, so no, I guess the quick question would be no. Uh, there were racial exclusion laws. So there was the famous Chinese Exclusion Act and overall the anti-Asian uh, immigration policies. Also, immigrants uh, from different countries were set at a, at, a, at a specific quota, quota that was tied to the demographics of the United States at the time, which is to say that white immigrants were prioritized, right? And you, you know, legally, uh, people from, from Asia, Africa, Latin America could not really immigrate. They couldn't exceed those quotas. But what is fascinating is how the United States was treating immigrants from the Ottoman Empire. Um, up to a half million Ottoman subjects immigrated by World War I. Most of them were Armenians from Anatolia and Christians from what is now Syria and Lebanon. Um, so they were immigrating primarily to the United States, Brazil, and Argentina. And pretty much in all those countries, they were subject to, there was this debate of whether they are, and I'm somewhat simplifying it, whether they were white Americans, whether they were black Americans. There were several court cases about this. And the idea that was put forward in one of the cases was that if you are, essentially, if you are Christian Syrian, right, you would be recognized as a white immigrant. If you are a Muslim Syrian, right, um, and then you would often be called in Turk, a Turk in the documents, no matter what language you spoke, uh, then you would be, um, you would not be recognized as a white immigrant, and there would be, you know, all kinds of immigration restrictions and all other restrictions against you. So racialization in the US society and in the Brazilian society was mapped um, onto immigrants from the Ottoman Empire. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating, Vladimir. Um, we have another seven minutes to go if anyone else wants to ask a question. Well, Vladimir, one thing that struck me, uh, I was visiting Moscow, talking with friends and so on, and they told me about anti-Caucasian sentiment that was presumably deeply rooted. In the Urals, we are the working people, but the Caucasians, many of them are criminals and so on. How far back does this go? Um, and does this play into this complex picture you are showing? This is also uh, a dimension of ethnic Interethnic attitudes. That's that's a great question. Um, I cannot really speak about the attitudes in the Soviet era and how people in Moscow and Saint Petersburg felt in the Soviet era about um, people in the Caucasus. There was also much less of a labor migration from the region to Moscow and Saint Petersburg at the time. Labor migration really begins uh, like in the 1990s with the collapse of economic security. Uh, and I would say that the anti-North um, Caucasian, anti-Caucasian, anti-Central Asian, anti-Muslim sentiments in general, plus anti-Armenian sentiments, I think they're linked to the Chechen wars more than, um, I, 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 think, I think it's about the Chechen wars. I mean, the, there was so much anti-Chechen propaganda and there was so much fear that the Wahhabists are taking over the North Caucasus. And this would be another region that like the new imperial vision of Russia, that Russia would lose as it lost the other 14 republics. So I think it, I, I, I would think that it's the, the late 90s. And of course, there's the uh, racialization aspect. And now that I can see the entire screen, uh, I see Gihada Baza in the audience. Uh, Gihada Baza is our fantastic PhD student in anthropology, and she's a specialist on return migration uh, from the Middle East to Abkhazia. Abkhazia is an unrecognized state that um, uh, broke away from Georgia, and it's not 
really subject to the Kremlin so it can pass its own repatriation laws, right? So we will learn a lot in the coming years from Jihad. And Jihad also this week passed her um, qualifying exam. So congratulations. Uh, but Jihad is also a specialist on uh, racialization uh, of, of uh, Caucasians uh, more broadly. Um, so, so there is something about North Caucasians not being seen as white or you know, as white as, as Slavs in the Russian Federation. And there is certainly bias. Um, well, if there are no more questions, then maybe we can uh, close this afternoon's talk. Thank you very much, Vladimir, for that really wonderful talk, you know, telling us about this really complex region with its multiple ethnicities and different religions and different nationalities and how complex it becomes to, you know, kind of unravel them and to think of how people look at themselves as, as people. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Vladimir. Thank you, Jan, for inviting me to chair this wonderful talk this afternoon. And bye, everyone. Have a happy Thank Thanksgiving. Very much. Thank you, Anshu. Thanks, everyone, Thanks, for Anshu. coming. Thanks happy everybody. Thanksgiving. One, what, one last word. Uh, next week, we have actually our final, um, final colloquium of the series. Uh, we're going to be hosting uh, Gerard Delanti um, from Barcelona, who's going to be talking about um, sociological perspectives on COVID-19. So it should be interesting. Have so a good see you all there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Anshu.